Hey, I'm Kamara Rose, and this is Everyday Changemakers, conversations with social change practitioners about the journey of personal transformation and social transformation. Threats can produce fear, or they can be transformed into challenges. Challenge, we move toward because we found some sense of hope, some sense of possibility, some sense of what can be. And that sense of possibility becomes a critical resource to challenge the fear. It's not that we lose the fear, but we find the resources to go into it rather than run away from it. This week, I'm talking to Marshall Gans, an organizer whose work has spanned the civil rights movement, the United Farm Workers movement, the Obama campaign, and more. He teaches the craft of leadership, organizing strategy, and public narrative to students around the world at Harvard University and through the Leading Change Network. Marshall's first organizing experience came in 1964, when he was a junior at Harvard and volunteered to work on voter registration for the Mississippi Summer Project. The theory of the Summer Project was that African-American organizers of Mississippi were being beaten, being arrested, uh, worse, and so the law didn't protect them. So the idea was, well, maybe if we bring people who the law does protect in Mississippi, that can also bring the law to Mississippi. Marshall was being trained with other volunteers to organize a new Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that would challenge the segregated white party at the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City. And the night before we were supposed to go to Mississippi, we got word that three of our party had disappeared. Andy Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. They had gone down a week earlier to Meridian, Mississippi, been sent to Philadelphia, Mississippi, to investigate the burning of a black church and hadn't been heard from since. Bob Moses, who was the lead organizer, called us all together in a college auditorium. And Bob was a very soft-spoken guy, and he got up front and said, we just heard what happened to our brothers, and we don't know exactly what happened, but we think we do know what happened. We think they're gone. And sure enough, two months later, their bullet riddled and beaten bodies were found buried in dirt levees where the Ku Klux Klan had taken them after executing them when the sheriffs turned, turned them over to them. We didn't know that then, but we had a pretty good idea that like that was up. So Bob said, look, I'd like to tell everybody, just go home, forget about it. But I can't. I need to ask you to go. But I can't take that whole responsibility. Every person here needs to decide. And you know, if you decide you can't go, that's fine. There's no shame attached to that. But you need to decide. And so I sunk into my chair and, you know, complete silence. The whole place was entirely silent because everybody sort of went into the reflection like, whoa, what did I get into here? You know, you know, is, it, is this what I expected? So, you know, for myself, I began asking myself those questions like, what the hell was I doing there? Well, you know, my father was a rabbi, my mother a teacher. we lived in Germany uh, for three years after the Second World War when he was a chaplain in the American Army. And a lot of his work was with Holocaust survivors who I met as a child. They would come through our home trying to find hope somewhere after that horror that had shattered their lives and, and so many lives. Marshall's parents had interpreted the Holocaust to him as not just about anti-Semitism, but about racism and that racism kills. They taught Marshall that racism turns people into objects. And once you do that, you can do anything to them. Now, as a rabbi's kid, you have to go to all the stuff. <laughs> and uh, I love the Passover seders. I love the telling of the Exodus story. And there's always a point where they would, they would point to the kids and say, you were slaves in Egypt. He said, I, I, I've never been a slave. I've never been to Egypt. It took me a while to get what it meant was that it's told generation after generation. And you kind of have to figure out, are you with the guys with the char chariots and the horses? Or are you with those people trying to trying to find 
a land of promise uh, for themselves. All of this was going through Marshall's head as he sat in that chair in that auditorium. And as we were sitting there, a young woman named Jean Wheeler stood up in the back and began to sing. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say freedom is a constant struggle. Oh, Lord, we struggled so long, we must be free. They say freedom is a constant dying. We've died too long. We must be free. And when she began to sing, it was like the spirit entered the room, like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is this is what we need to do. This is what this is. And other people began to join in the song. And then you stop being this isolated individual, fearful about what could happen. And you become part of a community that finds courage in each other and in the moral foundations of what the whole damn thing is about to take the risks. And as she stood up and began to walk out of the room, everyone filed in behind her. And the next day, everyone went to Mississippi. Now that was a life-changing moment for me because it was in Mississippi that my real education with all due respect to Harvard about race, power, and politics in America began. And it's where I really found what was to be my calling for the next 28 years in organizing. That's a really powerful moment that you're describing. And when you moved forward and said, okay, despite my fear, which is very real, you know how sometimes, I don't know, social psychologists or other people will talk about, you know, the fear impulse. It's it's like there's a bear at the door or it's like, right? But in this instance, the the danger was very, very real. Was there a wisdom, I guess, or a truth that emerged for you in stepping into that fear? I think that, you know, threats can can produce fear or they can be transformed into challenges. And, you know, as you know, fear we run away from or we hide from or we may react and strike out. Challenge we move toward because we found some sense of hope, some sense of possibility, some sense of what can be or what could be. And I mean, I like the Maimonides definition of hope, which is, it's not flowers in May. It's not what some people call hokey hope. It's, he described it as belief in the plausibility of the possible, as opposed to the necessity of the probable. In other words, that to be a realist is to recognize that while it is always likely probable Goliath will win, sometimes David does. It was improbable we would elect a black man president of this country in 2007, but we did. And that sense of possibility uh, in our own life experience and that of our communities and in our moral resources, faith traditions and so forth, that, that becomes a critical resource to challenge the fear supported often by relationship, solidarity, and ways in which we can feel a greater sense of self-worth. So the threat turns into a challenge. It's not that we lose the fear, but we find the resources to go into it rather than run away from it. Hey, everyone. I'm pausing the conversation here because you may want to discover your own courage to turn threats into challenges. And for that, as Marshall says, you need to find your sources of hope and possibility to give you strength. If you need it, I developed a free reflection tool for you called Sources of Hope, and you can find it at kamararose.com backslash resources. The link is in the show notes. It's a short journaling exercise to consider your own life experiences and sacred texts 
in order to find new perspectives and new power as you confront challenges in your own life and community. So go to kamararose.com backslash resources to download the Sources of Hope Reflection Guide and find some new possibilities for creating change. Also, in this conversation, Marshall references a number of scholars and authors, and I want to let you know that I listed them in the show notes as well, in case you want to check them out. Okay, back to the conversation. In Mississippi, Marshall found that organizing allowed him to use and transform his own sense of outsiderness. We always lived in places where it was a very small Jewish community, and I certainly grew up within that narrative of wandering and outsiderness. And when I come from Bakersfield, California, to Harvard, I mean, Jesus, that was like, uh, you know, it's elitist now, then you really should have seen it. Uh, Zimmel, the sociologist, wrote this classic essay called The Stranger about the Jewish experience in Europe of sort of being in the community, but not of the community. That sort of became the model for Alinsky's idea of the organizer who was in but not of, and therefore in tension with in what could be a very constructive way. It's kind of the insider-outsider sensibility that's captured in Moses, who is the Jew who was an Egyptian and has to deal with that tension it's destructive, and then it turns into a creative force. And so that clicked for me. And when I left Mississippi, then instead of going back to school, I went to work with the farm workers in California. I'd grown up in the middle of the farm worker world. I hadn't seen it without my Mississippi eyes that allowed me to see a, another community of people of color, also without political rights, also without economic rights in California with its own rich history of racial discrimination going back to the native peoples, the Chinese, the Japanese, and so forth. So it turned out that Mississippi was not an exception to America, it was an example of the America that we needed to change. Marshall stayed with the United Farm Workers for 16 years, learning the craft of organizing. Then he spent another 10 years doing electoral work on California congressional and gubernatorial campaigns, including Nancy Pelosi and Jerry Brown, before returning to Harvard in 1991 to finish the bachelor's degree that he had left in 1964. My 81-year-old mother got to come and see her son be a college graduate. I got to take care of that and then decided to do a Ph.D., it allowed me to then dig into this experience that I'd been through from a different set of lenses. And I was asked to teach a course at the Kennedy School in organizing because I'd done my I'd done a master's here. And that turned out to be a, a gift because it was a way to connect my life experience in social science in a pedagogical conversation with a rising generation. It was kind of like oh, you get to go to class twice a week and have a conversation with the future. That's a pretty cool thing. Through Marshall's students, his practice has continued to grow around the United States and around the world. He's brought his training on leadership and organizing to the first Obama campaign and to growing organizing efforts in countries including Serbia, Jordan, and China, supporting leaders everywhere to translate their values into power to make social change on issues ranging from healthcare, education, immigration, gun violence, domestic violence, and the list goes on. The basic approach that we take to this organizing is in the context of an approach to leadership that's rooted in Rabbi Hillel's three questions. The first one was, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? not selfish, but self-regarding, that I need to get clear on my values, on my expectations, my interests, if I'm going to assume a leadership responsibility. But then the second question, he says, ask yourself, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what is to recognize the fact that we exist in relationship with others in the world. And our capacity to achieve our goals is inextricably wrapped up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. 
And finally, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? Not advice to jump into moving traffic, but a caution against what Jane Adams called the snare of preparation. You know, just another year of strategic planning, we'll have the perfect plan, the world will then conform to our expectations, which of course it never does. Or just another degree, and I'll finally have all the knowledge to go out and be the expert. It's not so. It really calls attention to the fact that we can rarely learn to do well what we want to do until we actually begin to do it. And that understanding flows from action, not preceding it. And so to me, leadership's about the interaction of those three elements, the self, the other, and action. And the fact that they're questions is important, too, because the context of leadership and certainly organizing is not certainty, but uncertainty. I mean, people never say, where's the leadership when things are going well? It's, it's always challenge, dilemma, contradiction. That's difficult to accept because the challenge to the hands is, do I have the skills to meet this new thing? The challenge to the head is, can I use my resources in new ways to confront this challenge? It's a strategic challenge. And then there's the question of where do I get the hope? Where do I get the courage? How do I inspire that in others? And that's a challenge to the heart. So it's thinking of leadership then in a head, hands, heart way. And in that way, it's thinking of leadership more as a practice than a position or even a person. It's a set of work to be done rather than a charismatic personality or somebody giving orders. It's the practice that we're teaching, which we then summarize as taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. It's not a diva model of leadership, quite the opposite. It's about enabling others to achieve shared purpose and under uncertain conditions. Coaching is at the heart of it rather than direction giving. Continual learning is at the heart of it because if leadership is about coping with uncertainty, you never have learned it. You, you are always have to be learning and adapting. Well, I had a student last year who said, I used to think that the test of leadership was how many hats you could wear. What I realize now is how many people you can get to wear hats. And I think that that's the idea. I think a lot of people will identify with the feeling of just taking on everything yourself or as much as you can yourself. I know I've done that for sure. Is there just like guidance for people who this is a new practice to try on of empowering others to take a piece? <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. What do you how do you coach people on that? No, and it's and it's challenging. You know, there's a great chapter, Exodus 18, where Moses is trying to do all the stuff himself and he's burning out. And his father-in-law, Jethro, comes and observes that he's burning out and the people are burning out. He says, look, this is no good. You've you got to find one out of every 10 people to be the decision maker for that, those 10, and then one out of every those 10, one of those 10, and only let the most important cases come to you. Now, you can think of that as creating a hierarchy, but what he really did was empower the community by creating multiple tiers of leadership. And so that issue of trying to do it all ourselves not so much because we're power hungry, but because we're afraid to let go because we want it to go well. And, you know, our mo mothers told us if you want to do something well, you got to do it yourself. Well, it's not true. And Jethro, what he reminds Moses of is the fact that he's also a husband, he's a father, and he has a relationship with God. So his whole being doesn't depend on his work. And I think when we get so identified and we care so much then we're fearful to share the responsibility. But unless we share the responsibility, we drive ourselves and everybody else crazy. So this is something we confront directly. Yeah. Well, and on that note, because you talked about the fear of letting go of, you know, holding on to that work for yourself. And I think this is the the double edge of it, because a lot of people that I've been talking to about the challenges of leadership talk about, you know, how hard it is then when you're when you are doing things in community and in collaboration and how it can feel easier to do it yourself, right? But that when when you're working together, it's like so much needs to be negotiated and people have talked about the the commitment that you have to have to stay in relationship with people, to not walk away from the relationship. Yeah, but it also takes skill. I mean, mm -hmm. 
In other words, we know a lot about how to work effectively with other people. Teams, I mean, you know, soccer teams, string quartets. I mean, we know a lot about that. There is a resistance, though, to, oh, this is a craft, and I can learn this craft, and it's going to take some courage, and I'm going to fail because it's like learning to ride a bicycle. you you got to get on. First thing that happens is you fall, and then the moment of truth, you go and go to bed or you get back up on the bicycle. And that's a question of finding courage to do that. Carol Dweck calls it a growth mindset as opposed to fixed mindset, experiencing critical feedback as judgment about ourselves, she called fixed mindset, versus data about our own learning, which she calls growth mindset. And so creating not a safe space, but a brave space for learning is critical. And by creating a kind of a brave space for learning where there's scaffolding and support, then people begin to develop the muscles, the the emotional muscles that they need to be able to understand that failing and all that, that's part of the whole learning process. We're all learners in this. Now, that's easy to say. It's a lot harder to learn. And it's probably one of the most challenging things that that we work with our students on because they get all this uh, social enterprise where the world is created by individual geniuses who go out and create firms that do magic things. And so you're all geniuses. So go out. It's the opposite of the kind of leadership required for effective democracy. Uh, It is the opposite. A lot of that radical individualism is what we're up against in trying to enable people to get a much more collaborative understanding of group as a team. In social movements, they have the myth of the charismatic leader, but when you look close, you see it's a team. You know, people think the Montgomery bus boycott was Martin Luther King. Not really. It was E.D. Nixon, Rosa Parks, uh, Joanne Robinson, people that nobody's heard of because they haven't really seen how the leadership actually works. Hey, everyone. I'm taking a quick pause here to let you know about our guest for the next episode of Everyday Changemakers, Christy Pascal, a community organizer who has served as the political director for Faith in Action, a principal of movement building at Wellstone Action, and is now the national director of the Win Justice Campaign, a groundbreaking coalition to win key elections in battleground states in 2018. There's a lot of jokes between moms about like writing a birth plan and how our birthing experience is never exactly like the plan that we write. At some point, When uh, you go into labor, there's a point of no return and you are so in it that you can't turn back and you really have to rely on the set of people that you have brought into the space to be with you. They become a lifeline to help guide you through that journey. Listen to the next episode of Everyday Changemakers to hear how Christy brings her wisdom and power as a mother to think about midwifing an 11 million person movement to radically change our democracy and give birth to a new vision for the United States. Okay, back to the conversation. What do you imagine is possible, you know, within social change movements, the more that people are practicing that form of leadership, that form of team building, might it create some new possibilities? See, training is such an impoverished word for leadership development, because unless you're doing conceptual, behavioral and values based work, that's why I talk about it as practices rather than skills. If you just learn a skill, you're stuck at a tactical level. If you learn the concept In other words, why that skill is useful, then you can be imaginative and you can operate at a much more strategic level. In so many of the progressive movements, it's like training, you come, you get a skill, you know how to do a voter list, you go out, okay, go do it, okay, what happened, boom. There's no debriefing, there's no orientation, there's no respect for people's time and capacity. If if you get it... (laughs) and you see that people are actually your source of power, then you will invest in the development of people's capacity. And that's what we're talking about. That's why there's so much mobilizing 
there's a lot more mobilizing than organizing. A lot more of like, turn people out for the rally, done. Get them to show up X place, done. Without ever investing in the relational, the developmental, the emotional, the narrative work that it takes to create collective capacity. There's a wonderful book by uh, Zainab Tufechi called Twitter and Tear Gas, where she documents all these mobilizations that went nowhere, mainly because social media reduced the cost of mobilizing. And so you could do it without ever building the organizational capacity and the leadership to be strategic, to follow up, to make decisions, and so forth. It's understanding the difference and the critical foundation organizing and collective action and association is for democracy, and then investing in the tools, the capacity, and the training it takes to do it. But it's not rocket science. Right. Well, I'll be sure to point people, since so much of your work is open source and it's about getting access, like you said, to the craft, I'll be sure to point people to that work so they know where to find th those resources so they can do more of that practice. In closing, would you like to end with like a prayer or an affirmation or an intention, just calling forth what you are hoping for, both for all of the students that you work with, but also for all organizers, all communities? There's a song uh, Judy Collins recorded in the 60s, uh, and it uses the word freedom because the civil rights movement never called itself the civil rights movement. It called itself the freedom movement, which is a much bigger word than legal rights. It's about dignity. It's about solidarity. It's about possibility and so forth. And the song goes like this. Freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing. It doesn't fall down like the summer rain. Freedom, freedom is a hard-won thing. You have to work for it, you have to fight for it, day and night for it, and every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children, brother. Pass it on to your children, sister. They have to work for it, they have to fight for it, day and night for it, and every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children. Pass it on. Amen, thank you. Thanks. Sorry, I have to go. <laughs> no, it's no worries. I'm glad we could make this happen. Thank you for listening to Everyday Changemakers. If you liked this show, please take a moment to rate and review it in iTunes and to share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. We love it when you spread the word. As a reminder, the Sources of Hope Reflection Guide is available for you at kamararose.com backslash resources. You can find a number of Marshall's books, articles, and resources at marshallgans.com backslash publications. Everyday Changemakers is a production of yours truly in collaboration with markmedia.org.